it is, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking to all of you. Um, and so today, for the next 30 minutes, we'll talk about two subjects that are excruciatingly painful for a lot of us, you know, trying to deliver software and working in hybrid environments. And we'll put those two together, and we'll talk about you know, how we can avoid shooting ourselves in the foot, right? Um, so I looked around for some fancy quotes, you know, words of wisdom around delivering software in hybrid environments, couldn't find any, so we're going to coin one today, right? But before we get started, I might be preaching to the choir here for some of you, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page, let's go over some standard issue definitions of what hybrid cloud is, right? So it's generally you've got some piece of private infrastructure, it could be your on-premise data center, some edge network, you know, on some private infrastructure, could be in your private cloud. And you take that, you connect that up on, through some network interface to a VPC or a VNet or like a, a network on a public cloud provider, right? Now, generally, this network, you'll see this done in different ways. Uh, if organizations are OK with the bandwidth and the latencies of going over the internet, you'll see this done through VPNs. Usually, it won't be like a single VPN. You'll have a couple of VPN instances to fail over if like, your primary tunnel fails, right? Um, but if you're not OK with going over the internet through a VPN, you'd see direct physical connections between your private infrastructure and the public uh, cloud providers network. Now, it's not as easy as taking a bunch of wires from your server rack, walking into your public uh, cloud providers data center and plug it in, right? Uh, you do need to connect to something that we call a pop, uh, point of presence. And you need to go through a partner. It's going to cost you a lot more. But generally, if you do go through a direct physical connection, you'll see a lot less uh, latency and a lot more bandwidth. Again, it depends on organization's specific requirements. Now, this is like a very bare bones model and a definition for what hybrid cloud is. Uh, fun fact, hybrid cloud is not the same as multi-cloud. I didn't know that until very recently. Um, there are some reasons for that, but we'll uh, get to it as we go on. Now, let's talk about the whys, right? why people and organizations end up with uh, hybrid configurations. Now, this diagram, um, while it's very simple, it depicts the more common use cases, right? We have organizations that are on-premise. They're tired of their legacy infrastructure. They're doing some app modernization work or digital transformations or you know, whatever fancy words you want to call it. They're taking some software from their on-premise environments and moving it into the cloud. And in, during that process, you know, they might be looking at better scalability, burstability, or just going cloud native in general, right? And in some scenarios, you can't make the whole jump. You have to keep some of your capabilities on premise, and therefore you end up with a hybrid cloud. The same goes for the other direction. You know, there are folks on the public cloud, they've been there, they've done that. You know, they might be tired of playing chicken with their cloud provider, and they're thinking, you know, why can't we do this ourselves? The cloud repatriatists. I'm not sure if I said that right. But even WSO2, you know, we have some working groups internally that are considering it. There will be some BOFs and sessions later on, so make sure to join in if you're interested in that. Uh, the reason this diagram looks a little funky is because I think these are, in fact, cyclic things. You know, five, ten years ago, microservices became the norm, right? If you weren't doing microservices, you weren't doing software engineering right. But now we see it turning around. Um, monoliths are back in fashion, and we are fluctuating between the two ends of the spectrums, and you know, we have something in the middle, you know, distributed monoliths, so on and so forth. So I see this. I predict it will be the same thing here. We'll probably go back and forth, but over the course of those cycles, the gray area in the middle, the hybrid, um, domain that will become more dominant and a bit more common 
uh, in the years to come. And there are a bunch of other reasons, right? There could be hundreds of other reasons. You're happy with your on-premise setup. You want some burstable compute. Maybe you, know, you want to train some LLMs. It doesn't make sense to buy GPUs. You, know, you connect up to the cloud. Now, of course, in these, some of these cases, you don't need a dedicated network connection between your on-premise or private infrastructure and the cloud, right? You could go over the internet. But in certain other cases, you might have to. So yeah, lots of reasons. And the third and another domain is for business continuity, right? Now, I'm not a big fan of these types of architectures, but you see these spoken about a lot in uh, current literature. Like you have a production environment, your primary is on-premise, and then you have uh, standby a secondary production environment with a cloud provider. Um, it sounds great in theory, but you know, it is an easy way to shoot yourself in the foot. So we'll get into this as we go on. Now, uh, I had a dozen more of these, but unfortunately, due to the time constraints, I had to drop some of them and condense most of it. So we'll look at three of the most easiest ways to you know, shoot yourself in the foot while you're trying to deliver software in hybrid environments. And then we'll also look at some of the solutions you can use uh, to you know, not walk down that road of despair. So the first one is design rot, right? Now, if you work in any enterprise for any reasonable amount of time, you've probably heard all of these sentences, um, or at least one of them, right? So over time, systems and architectures tend to decay, especially if your underlying infrastructure is extremely complex. There's a lot of overhead on your developers and your designers. What happens is, without a reasonable framework to design your enterprise architecture, things will start to fall apart, right? And things fall apart faster, much faster, in uh, scenarios like um, in infrastructures that are backed by complex networks, like hybrid environments, right? So this is one big challenge when you're trying to deliver software in hybrid environments. How do you design a framework that helps you, uh, that helps your system you know, stand the test of time and not decay into complete madness? So we'll get to that in a bit. The other one is about portability. Now, a lot of people think hybrid cloud will make you portable, right? It, makes, it gives you the illusion that you can just take your production environment, chuck it onto the cloud or onto some private infrastructure, and just have some failover and make it all work. Uh, unfortunately, while that makes sense when you're 50,000 feet up in the air, when you zoom in, it's not, um, it's not as feasible as you think, right? Because with the advent of things like containers, moving your applications around, it's relatively easy, right? If you've got a Kubernetes running or you've got a Docker on your VM, you can probably take your container and just chuck it in there and it'll work. But the problem is, uh, in most of your stacks, applications, the portable applications, they front things that are not as portable, right? Databases, uh, message queues, other platform services. Um, without a deeper study of your own architecture, you know, it's very risky to assume that you can be portable or whether you can just be completely you know, vendor lock-in free. And we'll discuss that in a bit more as well. Again, this is the example I had before around business continuity, right? Um, you can, now, this is a very simplified example, but you'll see this um, in a lot of places. We have two replicated environments, but you know, your database is in one place. And if your database is RDS, for example, you are definitely locked in. We can obviously argue, right? There are ways around it. You can use an open source database. You can replicate. You can synchronize. But all of those come at a cost, right? And if you're designing for portability, you need to keep uh, things like this in mind because it is a very easy way to um, make your life miserable. So the other one is um, developer adversity, right? On the other side of the spectrum of developer experience, uh, Again, going back to Sanjeev's keynote, Atlas 
You know, they, he was cursed with holding up the world, but he didn't have to, um, you know, write code and fix bugs and join meetings, right? Uh, but developers have to. So not only do they have to do all the things that they're supposed to do, they also have to, you know, deal with spaghetti networks, uh, which are much worse than spaghetti code, by the way, and just deal with the intricacies of like a very complex infrastructure, right? So we've seen this a lot. Um, you get all the fancy tooling uh, for your cloud, right? You add a new cloud environment, everything's easier to set up, so it's all there. But in your on-premise environment where you basically you know, have half of your production systems running, you SSH, and you copy your source code, you transpile it there, and you run it, right? And there's no observability that spans across both of your, all your hybrid environments. Um, when something goes wrong, developers only see one part of it, right? So that leads to a lot of guesswork, frustration. Again, you're taking away what's important and just filling up the void with all these obnoxious things that you have to manage. So too many tools um, and not enough, not enough of a platform for you to focus on what's really necessary. Now, this is a pretty nasty problem in most hybrid environments, right? So let's talk about some common solutions to some of these problems. Now, the first one is getting uh, your design right, right? Before you can deliver software, you need to design your software. Now, of course, you know, this might be rhetoric at this point in time. You probably heard about cell architecture quite a bit. But um, when you are designing architectures for the enterprise, you need something that can stand the test of time, right? Something that's not deeply coupled to an implementation detail or a specific technology, because those change all the time. We have Kubernetes today, we might have something tomorrow, right? They come and go. But we need something to sort of model your domains, your utility services, um, and then something to reason with. Right? So this is why cell architecture is extremely beneficial, especially in complex uh, environments. Unfortunately, I won't be able to get into too much details, but there are some other sessions around cell architecture, so I highly encourage you to join those. Now, for example, in this scenario, right, we have three cells, and by definition, every cell is independently deployable, manageable, and observable, right? All the network ingress comes through either an external gateway or an internal gateway. Again, these are all abstractions, right? It doesn't, these are not tied to specific API gateways or uh, containerization technologies or anything of that sort. It's simply a way to model a domain into an architectural implementation, right? Now, this is another example I pulled from the white paper. And if you're keen, you'll notice all of your domain entities or the groupings are loosely coupled, right? And all the dependencies are through network interfaces, right? So this makes it an ideal choice for hybrid environments to, de for, uh, to design complicated systems in complicated infrastructures without, you know, getting too leaky with your abstractions, right? Basically, as all these units are self-contained, you can bas um, decide, okay, these services should remain on-premise because their capabilities are tied to the services that I have on-premise, and these other services should belong in the cloud. Or rather, if you are going for a more portable solution, again, portability comes with that strict marks, right? Uh, it depends on your stack at a much lower level than what you see, um, you know, 50,000 feet up in the air. But what you might have noticed here is that you now have a mechanism to design portable units. Right? Now, there is no simple architecture, at least not that I've seen, that you can just lift and shift across different environments. But with this, you do um, have units, independently deployable units, uh, that can be moved around, right? Things that are actually portable, if you are designing for portability. 
Now, moving on to uh, developer experience, right? Now, one of the problems um, that we usually come across in the modern enterprise is, on one hand, we have to be, uh, you know, we have to be part of the ecosystem. We have to consume other services, external APIs as part of our digital infrastructure. But at the same time, it may, we have to also govern our own uh, systems, right? We have to make sure we have a golden path for our engineering teams. We have to make sure people, you know, don't make mistakes, uh, open up security loopholes, cause compliance, nightmares. So generally, if you look at it, your ability to govern, right? Govern sounds like a nasty word, but it's basically a function of good automation and good processes. But what makes it hard is if you have a lot of control interfaces, right? You're using 100 different services, and if you have 100 different interfaces to work with, not only are you making it easier to you know, make mistakes, you're also making your engineering team's lives significantly harder, right? Because rather than just working on a set of easy abstractions, they now have to deal with 100 different uh, controls, right? Again, not scientific, I just came up with this to uh, get the point across. Uh, so the idea here is to centralize control, but to distribute capability, right? It's okay to bring in an ecosystem of tools into your digital you know, architecture, but try to keep control centralized, right? So this, is sort of, this sort of leads on to the idea of creating a platform, right? Um, it might also be why DevOps uh, eventually you know, became platform engineering. We realized uh, the ideal way to go about these kind of problems is to try and build platforms, right? Uh, and so when it comes to building platforms, we end up with these kind of problems. Actually, this might be the hardest one of them all, right? Finding the right golden path. Um, if you're too loose with your abstractions, you know, your developers are not basically being saved from the underlying complexity. You know, they're still being exposed to all the tooling uh, and the nightmares that are underneath the platform, right? But if your opinionated solution is too restrictive, developers can't get their job done, and it might get in the way of innovation as well, right? So this is extremely tr tricky, and this is why um, we always say if you're building a platform, you know, it's going to be a continuous, never-ending project, right? It's not a one-off thing that you can just build today and uh, release into the wild. So, at a, again, at 50,000 feet up in the air, even for hybrid environments, right, what you need is a central control plane, right? And your central control plane can basically coordinate, orchestrate, um, choreograph all the configurations, the policy management, the CI, CD onto your downstream data planes, right? Now, your data planes could be on-prem, it could be on the cloud, it could be multi-cloud, doesn't matter. And then, at the same time, you need to pump back certain metrics, audit traces, uh, observability data back into your control plane so that you can create uh, a single pane of glass, right? To look at uh, insights, operational metrics, the whole lot. Just to make your developers' life much easier, right? So now you interface by you know, accessing your control plane, and you don't have to deal with dozens of different uh, interfaces to get like a simple job done. So the idea here is, of course, to become platformless, even in a hybrid environment. Now, if you go back here, I don't. This is like a very watered-down version of what Corio looks like, right? Uh, some of you asked some questions around: Can Corio run on on-premises? Uh, can Corio support hybrid, multi-cloud? And the answer is yes, right? So this is all the things that we spoke about have been baked into Corio, right? Uh, and basically, this is how Corio achieves the notion of becoming platformless, right? You hide all of the abstract complexities away, 
and you make it easier for your developers to um, work with whatever infrastructure is you know, backing your digital architecture. And then, of course, the million dollar question is how do you do that, right? Uh, and I guess this entire conference is, uh, is about answering that question. You can, of course, build it. You can try to build it. Uh, some of you are already doing it. Or the other option is to you know, consider a solution where um, all of the hard lifting is done for you. So with that, that's it. Um,